am Lisa Oldham, Executive Director of New Canaan Library, and I am so very delighted to welcome you all here tonight. This is the 23rd annual Salant Lecture, and my 11th. I would say Sarah's probably been to 23, who she, you'll see in a minute. And it is wonderful at this time in history to be attending a lecture focused on the First Amendment, integrity in journalism, and the importance of both of those things as a country. I'd like you all to take a moment to silence your phones. And while you do that, I want to tell you just a little bit about what's been happening here in the last eight months. Since we opened our doors, we've offered 750 programs in this new library. We've, create, we've, we've had 1,700, uh, 2,700 new people join the library in that time. And all of, our, <laughs> all of our programs, like our fresh, dynamic collections of books and other materials, are supported through the generosity of our community. This year, our fundraising season has just kicked off, and most of you will have been offered an envelope as you came in. Our goal this year to put on all of the programs and buy all the books and do all the things we do here is $785,000. If you feel so inclined, please consider a gift to this year's annual fund in support of lifelong learning and cultural appreciation here at the library. I'm guessing all the phones have been silenced. And so now we all look forward to a scintillating discussion with Mr. Carl Bernstein. Before we get started, Please take note that our great friends from Elm Street Books are here, so please visit them as you leave. When the evening is done, please exit to the doors at your right. And before I introduce the next speaker, I want to thank a very good friend of the library who helped us bring Carl here tonight. Thank you, Jeff Fager. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Gleason, daughter. the daughter of Richard Salant, who will do the opening introduction uh, for this evening's event. Good evening, all, and thank you so much for being here. This is always a very emotional event for me because it gets me back connected with my father and everything that he did in his life lifetime. I also can't help remember that the lecture, uh, the last time I was here, was March 8th, 2020. Familiar date. All the buzz about COVID was just starting. And I remember about a week later thinking, wow, we got that one in, in, in under the wire. I am so glad that that is behind us and we are once again able to enjoy the Salant Lecture Series. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Carl Bernstein with us as our guest as we return to the Salant Lecture Series. As I'm sure many of you know, Carl is famous for breaking the Watergate um, scandal in 1972. And he is also renowned for his journalism for the Washington Post and five critically acclaimed books, including All the President's Men. Carl has focused much of his career on American, American politics and the abuse power. of Carl won the Pulitzer Prize for his early Watergate reporting, after which he continued to bring truth and integrity to the American public in major news outlets, including ABC, CNN, and the Washington Post, Post and integrity. Two hallmark words vitally, vitally important to Carl's approach to journalism and also sacred to my father in his re relentless pursuit of honest and reliable journa journalism and in uncovering the facts. Dad was dedicated to shaping CBS News, one of the most important broadcast institutions, into, and I quote Carl, an instrument truth. of This truth. is exactly the, the purpose, purpose of Salant Speaker Series. It is dedicated to encouraging news literacy and fostering a greater understanding of the responsibility of the news media in a free and democratic society. It is intended to generate public interest in news and current affairs and the manner of its dissemination. I. The series perpetuates the news media's First Amendment rights and their responsible and fair application. The format for tonight's discussion will be moderated by Julia Ray Hoddenfield, who is manager of adult programs here at the New Canaan Library. Carl, wherever you are. My father would be so pleased that you in particular are here tonight, given your commitment to truth and integrity in journalism. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your wisdom, and your insights into the world of journalism at this moment. Thank you. To say a word about Richard Salant, that I was lucky enough to grow up in an era in which maybe a half dozen news institutions, there were great leaders who were mentors for many of us in their commitment to great reporting, 
to the mission of a truthful, important press and its role in it, democracy. And that among those half dozen great leaders was Richard Salant. And so I'm really honored that I was asked to do this tonight and to hopefully talk about some things tonight that meant a lot to him and to a lot of us in the journalistic community. Thank you. It really means the world to New Canaan that you could be here, Mr. Bernstein. Carl, um, you are one of the nation's most renowned journalists for many reasons. Uh, you're practically a household name for your coverage of the Watergate scandal and your continued career in journalism at CNN, the New York Times, and many other, many other outlets. So we're just thrilled to have you. And we're thrilled to have someone else in New Canaan uh, tonight, not quite in the library, but there's some whispers about another, another celebrity here in town. Do you know anything about that, Carl? A little bit. Uh, was, I'll talk about family. For I'll get, get that out of the way. Uh, because actually, I haven't worked for the New York Times. My son, Jacob, is a great reporter at the New York Times for the style section. Uh, and my other son, Max, is, this is too weird, is Taylor Swift's guitar player and head of her band. <laughs> So I just texted him, I said, I'm at the library and I hear that Taylor is 100 yards from here. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and uh, just a weird, a weird coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I heard she was at the Elm restaurant, but that's, that's hearsay, second hand. That's and right. I don't have a second source. We need to make sure that our reporting is accurate tonight. <laughs> We're with the Pulitzer Prize winner here. So, Carl, again, thank you so much for being here. And you know, as I said, you, you're, you're a household name. And when I was doing research about you, though, one thing that really struck me was uh, reading Chasing History on sale at Elm Street Books. And what I loved was learning about your start to journalism and how, how quickly you got swept into the addicting and overwhelming at times force of reporting. Can you tell us about your start and the lessons that you had to learn quickly and how that helped you forge your career? Sure, and that's really what this book, Chasing History, A Kid in a Newsroom, uh, is about. I was lucky enough at the age of 16 uh, when I had one toe in the classroom, one foot in the juvenile court, and the other foot in the pool hall in Silver Spring, Maryland, outside Washington, where I was born and raised, yet hired at a great, great newspaper, the Washington Star, the afternoon paper in the town, outreported the Washington Post in those days in many regards. And I got hired as a copy boy, uh, which is to say a jack of all trades at the bottom of, of the ladder. And at that moment in 1960, Jack Kennedy was running against Richard Nixon for President of the United States. And I was at the Star for five years. Pretty much everything I know about reporting about journalism, I learned at that great newspaper and from mentors at the Washington Star. And I was lucky enough to go to the Washington Post, to have greatest of editors, Ben Bradley, uh, to have had as my partner, probably the greatest reporter of, of our time, Bob Woodward. And those are really my formative learning experiences. And I think what, what you see when you read this Book on one level, it's kind of a rollicking tale of this kid uh, who gets the best seat in the country at age 16. Civil rights movement is, is beginning. And, and let me say one thing, and part of the backdrop of the book and of, of my life, I grew up in the Jim Crow capital of the United States. I went to legally segregated public schools in the capital of the United States. How many people here know that this public schools of the District of Columbia were segregated by law. Amazing. There are two decisions in May of 1954, Brown versus Board of Education and Bowling versus Sharp. Bowling versus Sharp is the District of Columbia school system because Brown only applies to the 48 states. There were 48 at the time. And so there had to be another separate case for the District of Columbia and in a concurring opinion, Bowling versus Sharp decided that the District of Columbia school systems also had to be integrated. 
I went to school, as did my mother in this school system in the capital of the United States. It had a Negro division of schools and a white division. My folks were very involved in desegregating restaurants downtown in Washington, the only places when I grew up where black people could eat uh, at a table, where one cafeteria owned by, by a rather enlightened guy and government cafeteria. It was a Jim Crow town. We drained in Washington, D.C. the swimming pools rather than allow, recreation department did, rather than allow black kids and white kids to swim together. So part of this book, the backdrop, I went to work my five years at the Star bracket the Civil War by exactly 100 years later. And so the Civil War cast a pall over our lives in Washington, D.C. when I grew up there. And, and a, a lot of the book is about my coverage of the Civil Rights Movement, but I also got, I got to cover every aspect of what a reporter does. And I think, you know, Bob Woodward and I, for a half a century, we've been asked, well, well what is it that, that you guys did in Watergate? What kind of reporting is that? And, and rather than use the term investigative reporting, we've always said really about the best obtainable version of the truth. And that you see that methodology in all the president's men of how we went about the best obtainable version of the truth. And then in this book, I say, and it comes from covering the civil rights movement in this young part of my life, I say the truth is not neutral. And I think it's maybe the most important words in some ways in this rollicking tale, it's, uh, there's also a lot of very serious stuff. And you, if you read this book, I didn't even realize it, of course, when I was writing it, and, and happily the reviews made note of it, it, it bookends all the president's men. The two fit together, even though nothing in this book takes place, uh, it all takes place before Watergate all at the Washington Star, but the two fit together, and, and the two start to make kind of a coherent sense as a whole. So I'll, I'll use that as a kind of maybe the backdrop uh, and, and for this conversation tonight. And the other part of the backdrop, it's clear to me now, you know, at this age, how lucky I've been, and the kind of gratitude that I have, or the opportunities that, that, that I've had as, as a result of education of, of this kid by these wonderful people and by the kind of country that I grew up in. I would say that your education has led to so much of America's education. You have brought so much information to American readers um, and really changed, changed culture um, as, as a result of money, many of your uh, reports. And I, I, I want to delve into a bit about culture at the Washington Post, what it must have been like to be on the floor with Bob Woodward, with all of your colleagues. Um, can, you, can you take us into the, into the Washington Post for a little tour? I can, but I don't think I have to do much of it uh, because of the movie of all the president's men, and, uh, except that I'm not Hoffman and Woodward's not Redford. <laughs> especially the latter. <laughs> I should also add that, that part of my good luck is that I'm a college dropout. And, uh, you know, I was able to do these things because I was able to work full time at this age, uh, though the people at Star certainly were not happy about my dropping out and insisted that I finish college, and I didn't. And it's one of the reasons that I, I left to go eventually to the Washington Post, because they were insisting that I that I had to finish college, even though they had made me a reporter. Woodward says, and he's right, if it had not been for, for that movie of all the president's men, I think the dynamic of how we view Watergate, of how Bob and myself and the Washington Post are viewed, um, would probably be quite different and perhaps not nearly as significant as it is in our culture, to use your, your words. And, and the great thing about, about the movie is that it hews to what happened. And the set, actually, is an exact reproduction of the Washington Post newsroom, down to the trash in the trash cans, which, which the producers had the Post send out its trash to the soundstage in Hollywood. Uh, 
Uh, so, so there would be this kind of verisimilitude. One of the great stories, though, is, is that Ben Bradley, the great editor, and, and you see in the movie, you know, th this is not a tale of, of just two kids. You know, we were 28 and 29 uh, when the Watergate story began. When Nixon resigned, we were <clears throat> 30 and 31. When the book came out, there were a lot of people say, you got to make a movie out of it. And we said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but of course, we came around. And the Washington Post, it was very difficult to, to get the permission of Catherine Graham, the publisher, the great publisher of the Washington Post. She really had not really for this idea. It was great danger in, in doing it in terms of if, if it played with the truth, it would undermine you know, all that we had done and at the same time so much excitement about it. And so then came the question of how the movie would be cast. And, and of, of particular import was how Ben Bradley would be portrayed. And meanwhile, they, we had the screenwriter, William Goldman, uh, Don Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid had written this script. So it was thought by Redford and the great director, Alan Pakula, of the movie, Jason Robarts would be absolutely the right person to play Ben Bradley. And, uh, and Jason had, had had a rough go of it for a while. He had, he had an alcohol problem and a car crash and wasn't getting a lot of work in Hollywood. But uh, so he came in and he met with Bradley and he met with us and, and he, it was obvious he was the right choice. And uh, Goldman gave him the first draft of the script. And a couple of days later, Robards comes and he comes to see all of us and he, he says, I can't. I can't play this character. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, he says, look at this. All he does is say, where's the effing story? He says, page 32, where's the effing story? And he goes through the whole script. He says, but that's really what he does. I can't, that's it. And we say to him, that's what Ben Brackley does. <laughs> and that's what he did. And, and you see in that movie how we were guided and protected by this amazing institution. Remember, here we are, we're these kids, the rest of the Washington Press Corps at the beginning, as you see in the movie or read in, in the book, uh, is saying what these kids are writing is nonsense. It's not true. They had all fallen for the belief in the well-oiled White House machinery of the new Nixon who could not make mistakes. And, and in fact, obviously, the, real story was, was what we were reporting, but we were under a lot of pressure at the time. And I'll, I'll tell a story and I was going to save it for later. So um, very early in our reporting, and, and you, you got to remember, there, there's, you know, the atmosphere of, of this, this newspaper up against the lies of the White House and the President of the United States. Oh, maybe 12 weeks into the story, and we were being attacked every day by, by the White House, printing innuendo and hearsay and gossip and one thing, thing and another. And so arriving, I got a call from the guard downstairs, security guard saying there's a subpoena here, server here for your notes from the Committee for the Re-election of the President of the United States, Nixon's Re-election Committee. They were coming after our notes. So I said, keep that guy down there. Don't let him up in the elevator. <laughs> And, and I, I went to Ben Bradley and I, I said, there's a Venus server down on 15th Street. What do we do? Keep him down there and let me go talk to Catherine. So Ben Bradley goes up to Catherine Graham, her office upstairs. And then he comes back 10 minutes later. Bob wasn't in, in, in the office this morning. And uh, Bradley comes back to me and uh, says, Catherine says they're not your notes, they're her notes. And if anybody is going to, I still get emotional about it. If anybody is going to go to jail, it's going to be Catherine Graham, the public. That, Think of that. Think of that kind of courage. And you got to remember what the atmosphere was in the country at the time. And so we had that. And knowing that we had that kind of backing. And yes, we, you see in the movie of all the president's men, we made some mistakes. And one big one. And, and yet we had their backing at every step. It made all the difference. That's real leadership. It really is. And I could see how that must have inspired you to prov to continue I mean despite all of the challenges did you ever think about okay I can't do this anymore this is this is too much pressure no you're you're not a quitter look well, it's not only that let's get one thing straight reporters love good stories it's <laughs> it's not a, that part's not a hard show and I can't think of a, a better story and and it's interesting because 
you already had 12 years under your belt by the time Watergate came to, to your death. So what was, you didn't back down after Nixon and, and his office gave you a tremendous amount of pressure. Not only that, you continued reporting on politics and presidents since Nixon. Can you tell us a little bit about some other experiences reporting on presidents since Nixon? Sure, and I'm going to say something else about Bob, though, at this point. You know, the amazing thing that Bob has done since Watergate is, is that he has provided this country and the world with inside accounts of every presidency since Nixon. And the reason that we have a basic body of truth about the American presidency for the last half century is at its core because of Bob's reporting. And, you know, we've been lucky enough to be, we've had this amazing experience, both then, and then we find, and you've, there are copies of all the president's men here, we wrote a new introduction to the 50th anniversary edition of all the president's men, in which we said, as, as I had said on the air, as Bob's reporting in his last book on, on Trump demonstrates, Donald Trump is the first seditious president in the history of the United States. And we lay out in this new introduction, we compare, we say, never could we have imagined that after Nixon, a criminal president such as Nixon, who sought to undermine the very basics, basis of American democracy, the electoral system, through a vast campaign of political espionage and sabotage, which at its heart is what our Watergate reporting was about and what Watergate was about at its core, that something like this could happen again. And then as we say in that intro new introduction a half a century later, at our age, starting at age 28, 29, and now we're 79 and 80 or whatever the hell it is, and, and then we say, and then came Donald Trump. And obviously what we have both reported then on the air, and we found ourselves on the 50th anniversary, and we say to each other, can you imagine a half century later, here we are, we're on the air together, doing commentary on the January 6th hearings. We've both been reporting on this subsequent rape of American democracy, and here we are, both country, the world, and these two guys typing. So, uh, so we've been amazingly Fortunate. But obviously, we're living in a time of, of, of some real horror. We can talk about that. Yes, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on the, the current climate of um, not only politics, but information and uh, what it feels like to be a journalist reporting on um, on on this new this new behavior, but it's 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 really like history repeating itself in some ways. Can you tell us about what it's like, what the climate is? As, as a journalist right now? I, th I think, you know, every, we all experience life and in its own time. Wouldn't want to get too nostalgic either about the Watergate era versus this era. But there, there is an essential difference. Let's, let's start with, let me say this. It seems to me that, that the most important story in the world today, if we were going to really look at what's going on in the world around us, and here we are tonight, the President of the United States is, is about to go on the air in half an hour to talk about a war in the Middle East, war in Ukraine, at a time when we thought the Cold War had been won, we were going to have this peace dividend, the idea that there would be a leader in Russia who was a Stalinist, a butcher, that we would experience what we saw this week, in the last 10 days in Israel, no matter what perspective you come to this event with, slaughter, news. But the most important story, and I think where, where there's a, if you look at what's been going on in the world in a coherent way, and especially as, as a reporter, is the pendulum swinging away from democracy. 15, 20, 25 countries. What we you know, imagine from the, the days of Gorbachev to what we see now, imagine what we see in Hungary today, what we see in Turkey, we see in, throughout the world in, in key places that, that moving farther and farther away and in this country, a political party. You know, you would think the most radical major political party in, in, since the 20th century, the 
idea that the Republican Party would become a radical party, if any party was going to become a radical party, you would have expected it to be. But to see where the Republican Party is, is today and, and the Trump presidency. And, and one of the things that, that, that I talk about a lot is I think we need to start looking at the Trump story, MAGA, whole story. Big mistake in politics and journalism and thinking that politics and journalism exist apart from the larger culture. We've been in a cold civil war in this country for 30 years or so. I've written about it, I've talked about it. Trump ignited that cold, but the cold civil war itself has been such a huge factor in who we have become as a culture, the people of the country. It's not just about the institution of the Republican Party or it's about real, live citizens. And the idea that somehow the Trump movement is a bunch of white guys sitting under a tree, you know, working class white guys, and, and that's, that's really what the base is about. Nonsense. This is a huge movement that cuts across all kinds of strata of our, our people. And, and so we now have going to suggest that, that, that most people who vote or identify themselves with, with Donald Trump are neo-fascists. But we are also looking at phenomenon, peculiarly American kind of neo-fascism. If we were to look at the definition real of what fascism is, its essential elements outside of ownership of, by the state, we have a situation in this country, a movement that is mainstream, raced a peculiarly American kind of neo-fascism. You know, I think the left is, and I come from a family that could be characterized as left, me, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter, I, this notion of the best obtainable version of the truth, I'm not a, an ideologue of any kind. And it, at the same time, it's important to recognize guilty to the best obtainable version of the truth. What is it that we're dealing with? Those elements are, are there, and who are we as a country, as a people? Obviously, we're divided. The idea that one of our two political parties would embrace what it has in these past Six years, including most people, I think the, the, the polls show this, most people who identify themselves as Republicans and voted for Donald Trump and continue to favor his, his re-election, uh, most of them know he really lost the election, and yet willingness. Okay, he says this, this was sedition. The last seditionist, seditionist president was Jefferson Davis, the Confederacy. We've never, look, we've had great demagogues in this country, McCarthy, never president of the United States. Anyway, I'm going, going on here. I don't think anyone minds if you go on and on. <laughs> there's, so, there's so many things in our, in our cultural climate right now, in our information age, that can feel overwhelmingly negative. So as a renowned journalist, what tools do you use to not only stay on top of the news, but also maintain your journalistic integrity? I imagine that there's pressure to pander. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? I think we can talk a little bit about about the news and media atmosphere. Um, and one of the things I want to go back to, though, let, let, let's stay on the subject of the Republican. Between the era of Watergate and the era of Trump, in terms of what happened to the two presidents and the two presidents, that Richard Nixon was forced to resign the presidency, and Donald Trump twice was acquitted in Senate trials after impeachments that, with a division that was totally partisan, except for three, four votes here, here and there. Republicans, in many ways, are the heroes of Watergate. You remember, Richard Nixon had the support of most of the country through most of Watergate, and certainly of the Republican Party. We were the targets of the Republican Party, the Washington Post, Bob Woodward, myself, I'll tell a little story about that in a couple minutes. Nixon was determined to make the conduct of, of the press the issue in Watergate, and it was working. And then came the tapes and the Saturday Night Massacre. I have, I have a little invitation, that it's on my calendar. This Saturday, there's an observance in Washington for the 50th anniversary of the Saturday Night Massacre. And, um, and then came the Saturday Night Massacre when, when Nixon insisted that his attorney general actually shut down the Watergate investigation. Of course, the Attorney General of the United States resigned and his Deputy Attorney General re resigned and came to be known as this Saturday Night Massacre. And then the disclosure of the tapes, what was on the tapes, 
gradually public opinion started to move against Richard Nixon because we had a culture at the time that was much more responsive to the best obtainable version of the truth. I think, you know, I don't have no metric for what I'm about to say, but I, I know I'm right about the following, and, and that is that, that most people today are looking for news and information and media that will reinforce what they already believe. And this, incidentally, there, there's no angel on either side of this one. This is becoming terrifyingly universal. But there was an openness to the best obtainable version of the truth, including among Nixon people, Nixon backers. And when they saw these tapes, what was on the tapes, that was it. Nixon fully expected that the Supreme Court, led by the Chief Justice that he had appointed, Warren Berger, would find in his favor because of Berger, and that Berger would find a way to get the court to declare that Nixon didn't have to turn over his tape. What happened with those justices? Got in the room and Berger says, we have to have a unanimous opinion. that No one is above the law in this country, including the president. He must turn over. So then you had that decision by the Supreme Court. So much to do with that. And then Nixon, you had hearings, Watergate committee hearings, historic hearings. Let me say here, there are three great congressional investigations in my lifetime. The Army McCarthy hearings, Senate Watergate committee hearings, in the January 6th hearings, which in many ways might be the greatest of all. The circumstances under which they were conducted, refusal of the Republicans to participate in it, except for you people, including its great chair. The amount of information developed so quickly, by the, and, and with a wall of disinformation, lies, and misinformation, from they were able to produce in such a rapid period of, and with one of the mechanisms of the two parties refusing to participate, aid this investigation. Think of the atmosphere of Watergate committee. What did the president know and when did he know it? Republican vice chairman do what we saw in the January 6th. Event. And then in Watergate, he votes in articles of impeachment voted in the House came from Repub brave Republicans who could have cost them their seats in Virginia, in the South, in the North. He votes. So it was a bipartisan vote for the Articles of Impeachment. And then Nixon dug in. He was not, he was thought he could win in a Senate trial. And a delegation of Republican leaders of the House and led by Barry Goldwater, the great conservative. 1964 nominee of his party to be president of the United States, led a delegation to see Nixon in the Oval Office after the articles of impeachment had been passed by the committee and it was a sure thing that Nixon would be impeached by the full house and there would be a Senate trial. Goldwater and these five, other, I think it was five other leaders. And, and when Bob and I wrote the book called The Final Days, our account of the last year of the Nixon presidency, we went to see Goldwater and, and he welcomed us in his apartment poured a couple of big scotches with, from tumblers. And Classic. He said, I'm going I'm to show you guys something. And he pulled out a diary that he kept of the following that I'm about to describe. Or got the diary in front of him. Describes how Goldwater was sitting right across from Nixon. The other leaders were to the right and left of the desk in the Oval Office. Nixon looked at Goldwater and said, Barry, how many votes do I have in the Senate? Fully well, expecting that Goldwater would tell him he's got a pretty good shot at being being acquitted at trial because you need two-thirds, as we see in the Trump vote, two-thirds of a vote of the Senate to be convicted and removed from office. Goldwater, Nixon looked at Goldwater, and Goldwater looked back at Nixon. Goldwater is reading this from his diary to us. I said to the President, and I, Mr. President, right now you might have four or five votes. You're not going to have mine. That was the end. The next night, Nixon announced that he would resign the President because of the courage of Republicans. So compare. That is the underlying difference in where we are today in many regards. That we had a political system, media aggregation, country in which the citizens, by and large, of the country were open to the best obtainable. I think that's where we need to look at, at some essential differences. And now we have, think of the idea. We have a war in the Middle East, war in Ukraine, both with elements of genocide, and a Congress of the United States, a House of Representatives that can't effing meet. That's a pretty messy situation that we've got on our hands. Why don't, why don't we let some of the folks here, I think, would like to 
have some. Do you have one that you particularly like there that you want to? Well, talk one that I want. While I have you here, that um, that I wanted to ask you was. I think librarians and journalists, maybe it's because I'm the daughter of a journalist myself, Chris Hoddenfield in the audience. Hi. Hey Chris, um, who, who interviewed me when I was 28 years old, I think. Or, yep, for or Rolling Stone magazine. 29. I grew up in a household where, you know, journalists, librarian, are very much aligned in our mission to not only make, um, to, to find information, but also make it accessible. And now we are experiencing an age of book banning. And I think you have a personal anecdote to share with us that is going to surprise people. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what book banning, how book banning plays into this current climate that we're living in? Well, let's talk for a minute about the First Amendment. Because what makes us different as from all of the other Western democracies, from all of the democracies, is the First Amendment. The Constitution of the United States, and we can have a whole discussion about the Constitution and the ways in which it does not work in many regards today, which we have fundamental problems. The Second Amendment is, is an obvious one, uh, but the fact also that we can't amend the Constitution of the United States because it requires the ratification uh, process that it does with, with three quarters of the state, three quarters, is that right, of the state legislatures. The last uh, really important uh, amendment was the ERA that failed. If any constitutional amendments are, are going to pass, they're going to be from the right, and they're going to further restrict our freedom in this country. But the Constitution, we're the oldest democracy in the world. We're a young country, but we're the oldest democracy. And I think it's a subject we need a lot more reporting on. Does our Constitution, which we revere, and maybe we give a little too much nostalgic reverence to, yes, there's a lot in it to revere, particularly the First Amendment uh, and some of the other first ten and the fourteenth, God knows, uh, but maybe we need to report a little bit more on does our Constitution work? And, and the whole question of the First Amendment, it gives us this incredible freedom. I would argue right now, and I, you know, at first I thought, well, everything you know that we're we're hearing about woke culture beginning sound like this might be a, a right wing trope. You really look at the reporting that's been done, and and what there is a huge threat to the First Amendment as a result of woke culture. I think that, that woke culture is a scourge in many regards, it has bled into <coughs> fear in our institutions, academic institutions, our journalistic institutions, in which it's reflected in coverage, ways that seem to me to be not about the best obtainable versions of the truth, but rather about perhaps caving to some ideology. I realize this is a difficult, complex subject. I think we, we need to look at all, because what does distinguish us so much, look at Great Britain with an official Secrets Act. Look how we were able to publish in this country again because the Supreme Court said the Pentagon Papers can be published. You cannot have that prior restraint on the press. And could Watergate happen, without happen. that decision or the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Pentagon Papers case exactly a year before Watergate? I don't think so. So we have this incredible gift and the idea, I mean, I remember when I was in the sixth grade, wonderful decision came down in Lady Chatterley's Read Lover. dirty books. <laughs> yes. What a gift. Because up until then, we had to smuggle them. All those old Olympia Press editions. But yes. And so the, the court then extended. That, no, in, in that decision. And so it, it's become absolutely understood understood in this country, we don't ban books. We do. We now ban books. And we ban books in many states. I don't know the you I saw that my publisher put out a thing online, video presentation of its books, Simon & Schuster, that have been banned in various jurisdictions. Catch-22, All the President's Men, Kill a Mockingbird, etc. And, and, and then you think, but also come back to woke culture. You also have got a movement to that certain aspects of language and literature and usage are now considered offensive when in fact they're part of what people wrote. They were part of what people said at the time. And I mean, I'm talking largely the idea that Mark Twain 
would be banned on one side, and then you have other people in this that don't want books that use the word Negro. But, but the larger problem is, is, is what we're seeing. It's coming from the right. I'm just amazed to, to see all the president's men on this list of banned, banned books. Yes, and, and to be clear, this is happening everywhere, and this area is not immune from book challenges. Um, and which is the community's right. The community has a right to say, hey, I don't want this in the collection. But getting back to our First Amendment, it's, it's equally important in both sides, for the right, the left, center, all re-examine why we have that First Amendment and what it really means. And there's so, there's so much else I want to talk to you about while I'm on the stage, but I want to be—I want to be generous. We want to be generous to our to our audience here. Who has who has some questions? We have our lovely mi two mic runners here, and they're gonna they're gonna choose a few people. So if you have a, a a question, raise your hand. Thank you, Carl, for coming to talk to us. Thank um, you for having me. I th thought I heard you say earlier, uh, the truth is not neutral, and I'm struggling with that because maybe I'm thinking. Neutral is unbiased. Can you help me out with that? Yeah, I, and I, I should have done it at the time I, I said it. I came to realize this when our great reporters at the Star, many of them Southerners, were covering, among other things, lynchings. The truth of a lynching is not neutral. And so I've given a lot of thought to this, and I've always thought, and it's again coming from my experience beginning at, at the Star and at the Watch, that this idea, this myth of, quote, objectivity, that we have had in the press is not only myth, but that it's it's a yoke that keeps us from getting to the best obtainable version of the truth. And let me, because it implies a kind of neutrality of fact. To, let's say that uh, we got a, a robbery bank down the street. A guy comes in with a long gun and points it at, uh, well, there are barely any tellers left, but. Whatever the case, here's a bag, give me all the money, stuff it in a bag. Money goes into the bag, guy with a gun runs out, disappears, manhunt goes on for six months, finds him, finally, cops find him, uh, way to hell. alibi, he's living with cousins, they say he's been there the whole time, he's been keeping a diary, he enters the dates for when the robbery took place, there are all kinds of stuff that's been created. But there's a video camera in the bank, and so the arrest is made, and uh, the prosecution prepares its documents based in large part on the video camera recording, voice recording, audio recording, video recording. So you're reporting that story, and the guy's lawyer says, you, you got to give half your story to our alibi? I don't think so. What, what is the best obtainable version of the truth? What, it's not neutral. And so that this myth of, and, and, and this idea of neutral has also come to represent centrism. And particularly, we've seen it recently in the, in the horrors that befell CNN, where for about six months, obviously the wrong person was put in charge of, of CNN. There was, I'm going to oversimplify something here, but there, there was a call particularly from one of the most important players in cable, John Malone, the idea, and then really needed to move to the center. The centrism was, was some kind of objective goal that we had been somehow too unfriendly to either Donald Trump or to the, to the right or to Republicans. I, I never did quite understand. But again, the idea of centrism as a goal be like saying leftism is a goal or rightism is a goal. I, I would add, if, if, if you're really talking about centrism as a goal, that were really the goal culturally in this country. We wouldn't have had a gay rights movement, a women's rights movement, a civil rights movement. The center uh, was kind of, you know, one of the things about centrism is it's, it's slow to uh, move to embrace, eventually might coalesce from the left with the left and but neutrality this idea truth is complex we have an absolute obligation to be fair one reporters tend to be lazy very often and you know that's a real threat we tend not to be good listeners think we know what the story is without spending enough time talking to enough people and i'm going to come back to all the president's men the movie the great thing about that movie that we could do in the book and describe it but never with such 
vividness as you see in the movie. It's all about going out at night and knocking on the doors. Earlier alluded to the technology. We have all this great technology to not just, you know, beginning with Google. If Woodward and I had had Google, we would have saved ourselves weeks. Much shorter movie. Getting, <laughs> no, it still would have been the knocking on the doors that got the information. It's just we would have found out their addresses quicker. So what is it about today's sort of try and bring a bunch of themes together here? Both about the truth is not neutral, but also about uh, what is real reporting and today's media configuration and social media. On social media, everybody gets to be Ben Bradley. Everybody gets to be a publisher. Everybody gets to be a reporter. So you, we no longer have an effective curatorial function over what is, quote, media. Same time, I would say, at the time of Watergate, you know, we had three networks, really. Uh, we had great local newspapers, which is another tragedy we can talk about another time the loss of local news and what that, that means. But I would say that, that one of the problems we had is, is that there wasn't enough latitude in what was, we didn't know enough whom today would go to social media, that, that we needed to open ourselves up more uh, in, in this rather than just a small media configuration. But, but now you look at what, re what is real reporting. It's what you see in that movie. It's what we learned to do at the star. You knock on the doors, source after source after source. You're not intimidated. I'll I said I would tell a story about Nixon presidency and its attempt to make our conduct in Watergate, the Washington Post, Woodward, myself, Bradley, Catherine Graham, and Watergate, rather than the president and his men. About 10 weeks after the break in at Watergate, we had learned knocking on those doors from the bookkeeper of the President's Re-Election Committee that there had been a secret fund that paid, by and large, for the undercover activities of the Nixon campaign against the Democratic Party, the last campaign of political espionage and sabotage conducted by, by the White House, and that five people had controlled this secret fund. So, so we had learned that, and that one of the people we found out was John N. Mitchell, former Attorney General of the United States, Nixon's law partner and campaign manager, would resign right after the Watergate. So we had it from a couple sources, and uh, we we're about to write the story. Bradley came, and the lead of the story was John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, controlled a secret fund that paid for the undercover activities of the Nixon campaign against the Democrats. And so Bradley called us into his office and said, sure, you got this for God. You know, it's airtight. And we said, absolutely. He said, never been a story like that, ever. And you're about to call the Attorney General of the United States a crook. And this newspaper's reputation riding on this, on you two guys being right about this. Said, absolutely. So we do the story, and uh, as we did on every occasion, we called the White House for a comment before the paper came out. So I called deputy press secretary at the White House, uh, and I told him we had a story in the next day's paper, and I read him the story, and uh, he said, all right, let me get back to you on that. All back half an hour later, and I put a piece of paper in a typewriter, which is what we did in those days, and uh, he said, here's our response. Sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation. Type that out. I said, yes. So that's it. Well, by now, we had come to call this kind of response to our stories to make our <laughs> conduct the issue. The non-denial denial. He didn't deny the story, it just came after us. So I said, well, aside, Mr. Press Secretary, from this geyser that you think is going off in our backyard, is the story accurate? Did Mr. Mitchell control those funds? Did those funds exist? The sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation, he repeated. So I said, okay. And uh, I had a phone number in New York where I thought I could reach John Mitchell lived in New York. So I called and he answered the phone. And I said, Mr. Mitchell, it's Carl Bernstein, the Washington Post. We have a story in tomorrow's paper. I'd like to read it to you and have your response. Go right ahead. I got as far as John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, controlled a secret fund. And Mitchell said, Jesus. <laughs> got a few more words in there. Controlled a secret fund that paid for undercover activities. Jesus. I got to the end of the first paragraph, by which time the, the drift of the story was unmistakable. Mitchell said, Jesus Christ, all that crap you're putting it in the paper, 
If you print that, Katie Graham, referring to Catherine Graham, our publisher, is going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer. I kind of instinctively jumped back from the phone. I was a little bit more worried about my own parts than Mrs. Graham's <laughs> at the moment. And there was a pause on the phone, and then Mitchell said to me the most chilling words I've ever heard to this day as a reporter. When this story is over, we're going to do a little story on YouTube boys. I don't know what he meant. It meant any number of things, but basically what that reflected was his view of a free press. I called Bradley at home, 10 o'clock at night, told him what Mitchell had said, and he said, Mitch Mitchell really said that about Mrs. Graham? <laughs> he said, you got good notes? And I read him back the notes, and he said, all right, leave out her tit, but put all the rest in the story. <laughs> and the next day, Mrs. Graham came by my, by my desk and says, Carl, do you have any more messages for me? <laughs> but the point is, making the conduct of the press the issue is something that has been a long historical technique of people who, are not in, who have an interest in undermining the truth. Uh, the amazing and horrible thing is that it's more effective today mm -hmm. than ever. And one thing I would say about the press in the Trump president, I think probably the greatest reporting, White House reporting by the greatest number of news organizations that I've ever seen since I went to work 65 years ago, has been in the Trump presidency. Compare the reporting on the Trump presidency, the whole White House press corps, what we had in water, in, in, in the Nixon presidency. You had this White House press corps that committed to this vision, smooth, white, well-oiled White House machine. Let's get someone in the back. Yeah, I think we Here have Here I am. I, okay, very okay. good. Uh, this has been wonderful, Carl. Thank you so much. I've been a fan of yours since, I don't know, 1972 or 73, okay? So this has been, this has been wonderful. Um, in any case, could you discuss a little bit about people like Barry Gold, Goldwater and Howard Baker, who were, you know, Republican senators then, um, versus what is happening in D.C. now, what is happening in the country now, bringing in parts about, well, democracy is both is difficult, and I remember one of my history teachers in high school said, in order to have a democracy, you need a well-educated middle class. Um, Basically, could, could you discuss all of this in relationship to where we're going now with of a large minority of the country not believing what truth and is. I think we have to look at the people of the country and, and the dynamic and, and of the world, too. We're talking about a culture. We're talking about a people. We're talking about citizens. We're talking about not about some abstract concept of party, necessarily. I think one that we can be a little too nostalgic about thinking, oh, there were these wonderful days. Uh, where Republicans and Democrats went to lunch together, well, they did. So let's not exaggerate either. I mean, the two examples you gave, Howard Baker, what did the president know and when did he know it? Thank God he asked those questions on the committee uh, and he became open to the best obtainable version of the truth. Baker did. He began as a stooge for the White House with a secret agreement with the White House that he would provide information back to the White House about what the committee was learning. But happily, he started to see the information, and he too was open to the best obtainable version. I don't think we can separate, this is why I come back to the term politics is a realm that is not separate from, from the larger culture. So that all of these, it's not just in Washington. How about at the diner down the street where, where people are unwilling to talk together? Or I think this goes much, much deeper. It's been the political system and those who are politicians are part of this, yeah. Have the Republicans been really smart about capturing two thirds of the state legislatures in this country? About the way they've handled judgeships at the federal level? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, all, all of this. But again, you know, this is a two-way street. This is a, an environment in which people have come to believe certain things that I or you might think are anathema to democratic values, but they do. And we need to be looking at why they do and, and, and 
not necessarily with, with a jaundiced approach. Why is it that there is such a swing, the pendulum has swung away from democracy in so, in so many places? I don't know the answers to these questions. I just know that we need to be looking at it. It ought to be a much bigger part of the journalistic agenda than simply saying, enumerating the dangers of Trumpism, which I think with a factual repertorial record. And also, we need to reach into history as, as journalists. We need to be looking at history. We need to be making analogies, or raising them at least, if they seem to be applicable. We don't know enough history, I would say, in this country, most of our high school graduates, from my limited experience. But so, no, I, I, I don't think this is a, I, th I think there's too much talk and not enough reporting uh, about this notion of polarized. What the hell does it mean? Polarized. How did we get polarized? Why are we polarized? What are we? Is it really that simple? I don't think it is really that simple. One of the things that, that happened at the Washington Post and the Washington Star, two great reporters, David Broder, whose dictation I took from Dallas, from David Broder, I was a dictationist, one step up from copy boy, and Broder was dictating to me. Two priests walked out of Dallas Memorial Parkland Hospital at 1.34 p.m. today and announced, comma, quote, the president is dead. That, too, is part of this story of this book. Broder, maybe one of, one of the three or four greatest political reporters in the 20th century, and Haynes Johnson, my other great mentor, who was, both of them Post were at the star. And Haynes gave me my first byline when I was 17, and he was assistant city editor. Every four years, they would go out on the road for two months, the two of them, and talk to Voters. And their reports gave such a sense of, of where, what people were talking about, what were on their minds, who these people were. We don't do an awful lot of that. That would tell me a lot more than stories about polarization. It's like we got one right there. Mr. Bernstein, thank you so much for coming here to our town and speaking to us. Um, I wanted, uh, going off of this idea of polarization and of technology, since you mentioned social media and a lot of the disruptions, I was wondering if you could speak to how programs like Substack also have affected journalism, since they're sort of in between. They're not quite social media, but they're also very much independent, almost the IF stones of uh, journalism. Let me say, Substack is a conglomeration. Uh, it's an inst it's a umbrella type of uh, news information institution. It has many different commentators, writers, news teams, working independently and individually. With Vic, the, there is so much going on. It is so terrific in news information and media, and particularly reporting, and particularly, quote, investigative reporting today, around the world and in this country, Substack is, is one thing, podcasts, it's incredible stuff out there about, quote, investigative reporting. We have lost, yes, newspapers, local newspapers, but, but we still have Awful lot of great reporting out of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, traditional news organizations. And we also have nonprofit reporting organizations, ProPublica, others. Oh, look, look at the reporting, uh, heroic reporting coming out of Russia, coming out of countries where reporters are dying and producing incredible reporting. I mean, I, I'm not one who thinks that, that there's a failure of reporting going on today, or a failure of information. What we do with that information and how it's consumed, and, and what I said about people looking for information to reinforce what they already believe, and even with the dearth of local news, death of local news, that began, incidentally, not with the internet, internet finished it, but began with outfits, chains, you know, newspaper chains coming into two newspaper towns, shutting down one paper, stripping the other one, and eventually, none of them. Let me give you the last question. Well, it sounds like we have our homework cut out for us, right? We need to delve into the history books, and we need to talk to each other at the diner. But my question for you is, in this world, OK, Washington Post slogan, democracy dies in darkness. How do we turn the light on? How do we keep the light on? I think that's the right question. It requires, back to the Catherine Graham example, they're my notes, it requires courageous publishers and financiers of whether it's philanthropic, whether it's
profit motivated requires courage. It also requires methodology. That's the most important thing. Tina Brown has got a piece. Tina Brown, the great editor, husband, Harry Evans, editor of the, the Sunday Times of London. Tina has a piece in the Financial Times today that I hope everybody will read about journalism. And I think it goes back to it again. You know, Tina just did an amazing conference in London. Woodward and I were, we were the keynote speaker. And, uh, about investigative journalism. There were a hundred different reporters there. And, and one of the things that happened, uh, if you can imagine such a thing, is among the participants was Alexis Navalny's person who ran Navalny's. How many people here saw the, the film, the documentary on Navalny? Because of all things, she brought us, this associate of Navalny's, a personal handwritten message from Navalny from the gulag, that he had just read all the president's men in the final days. And imagine how he'd smuggled this thing out and one thing and another, and we sent him back a message that we wrote longhand after the two of us doing our usual fighting well, dance. Part of this amazing conference on journalism and reporting. And so Tina has this, it goes back to this movie of all the president's men. Who are the people who Ought and then know. you go, you use common sense. You know, one of the things you see in that movie of all the president's men, it all takes place at night. The reporting, production is in daylight in the newsroom. But the reporting at night, when, when you, we, you know, we say, well, we can't go see these people in their offices. They're not going to talk to us. We didn't get information from Democrats. All our sources were Republicans. Mm -hmm. They were all people who knew and most of them supported Richard Nixon. You see in this little book about this kid, age 16, what does he learn from these great reporters? Or, and, and Bob has this great thing. He, he'll have an audience like, like we have here tonight, and he'll say, what's the best time to go visit somebody at their house? People raise their hands. He comes and says, 7 o'clock at night. They're going to be there, and they're going to have a little pop. That's the basis of it. And the other part of the basis of it is to listen. How many times, both as a television reporter correspondent, being a bureau chief on the network, see reporters, they got an eye. Also, not once on a major story has that story ever turned out to be what I thought it was going to be when I started on it. I thought Watergate in the first days was going to go to the CIA. I didn't think it was going to go to the Nixon White House. If I just kept following the story with the idea, here's where it's going, you keep going, source after source after source. It's always a surprise. And reporters, how many times do you see on television, congressional reporter, he grabs some Republican, shoves a microphone in his face, mm -hmm. he grabs a Democrat, what about this? And the idea being to manufacture controversy, not to get to the best obtainable version of the truth. Why, why isn't that reporter going to the office of each of those guys and sitting down with them for a while without the microphone. Then if you want to put them on camera, put them on camera. This idea, and also Eid, Bob talks about this a lot, the idea, you know, one of the things about his books, about books I've done, the luxury of time, and the internet ha has made that luxury even more precious and unusual. You need more time. But all I'm saying, and you'll see this in this piece that Tina has written, we have, look at the great ability that we have because of modern communications to transmit information like that, to make sure we have citizens their, with their webcams sending us images to enhance stories. the story. We have infinite space. My story used to be limited to 750, 1500 words because that's all that the editor said there was room for in the paper that day. Infinite. I can write as long as I want. We have these great tools. But the greatest tool? That's it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From all of us here at New Canaan Library, Carl Bernstein.